In this second phase of the project, I'm going to start out actually by establishing some of the darker values in the painting. We already have a really great linear structure underneath from the pencil drawing that I did that I've then reinforced with a bit of raw umber. That raw umber block in dries really fast and so it really makes a nice kind of bed to paint on top of. Establishing my darker values then is a logical next step in that it sets me up to be able to key the lighter values in my painting. To do that I'm taking a mixture of mostly ivory black and vermilion. There are places where I'll augment that mixture a little bit with some yellow brown and also a little bit of alizarin crimson if I feel like I need to darken and maybe warm up that mixture. But for the most part in these early moments I try to keep that paint mixture really super unified. Part of the reason is that I haven't really set the parameters for color and value in the painting just yet and because of that really they could be anything. I need to start with the most basic and simple organization that I can so one dark value, maybe two or three light values. Until I can get a handle on that organizational structure, I won't be ready to make the more fine-tuned color choices that eventually will make the painting look interesting. I also want to talk a little bit more about establishing those first set of values. I try to keep my darks not quite as dark as I know they'll eventually go. In this way, I give myself the room to have a little bit of an accent if I need to really push the darks a bit further and thus make the other darks that are not super black feel a little bit more vibrant and airy. In addition, my initial block-ins of lighter color values are also going to be a little bit below how light I know they will eventually be. This way of working from the middle out allows me to focus a lot on design, construction, shapes, and proportion and also gives me the space at the end of my painting to create the light and dark accents that I think make a real sense of excitement when we view a picture. In this initial block in one of the concepts I keep closest to my heart is that of maintaining the integrity of the planes of the head. Every time I choose a color and a color value I have to make sure that my application of that color value conforms to the value of the plane as I've constructed them in relationship to the light source. Put in its most simple terms, what I'm really talking about here is keeping the light values out of my dark planes and the dark values out of my light planes. By maintaining the sense of organization and integrity, I should be able to experiment with color in ways that create really beautiful harmonies at each level of the value scale. I mention all this because one of the major pitfalls that we have in oil painting is really to be seduced by color a little bit too soon. We look at skin tones and we see cools and warms and all sorts of really interesting color harmonies. But just because we see them doesn't mean we're able first to manifest them on the canvas. There's a lot of preparation and buildup that has to take place before we can get to those most subtle and exquisite of color value changes. So remember, in order to get to those really beautiful colors, the things that you need to do is build up your value planes in a concerted and accountable way. Value, after all, is really going to do most of the work when it comes to creating the big impression in your painting. Your assignment for this stage of the project is to gather all the paints that you're going to use and set them up on your palette in a nice and orderly way. I mention this sense of orderliness because there is so much chaos in the practice of painting that if there are opportunities anywhere along the way for us to make things a little bit more organized, it will free us up to think about some of the more complex problems rather than getting caught up in a messy palette. Our goal at the moment is really to fill up the context or put plainly to kind of fill up the canvas. Every color in our painting really is going to depend on every other color in order to work, which is to say a correct color in an incorrect context will show up as being incorrect. So we need to build the kind of baseline from which we can expand outward into all of our other color choices. In this instance, that's going to mean removing the color of the imprimatura. The relatively kind of cool neutral gray that is here is kind of suitable to bounce good warm flesh tones off of, but if we're going to get to more subtle choices about color values, we have to bring the painting to a place where we are prepared to do that. So our first block in of color values is going to be very, very simplified. We want to group the darks together, so the shadow values and the darkest dark really are going to be treated as one kind of unified mass of value. And we're going to kind of contrast that group versus the group of the lights and the midtones. So we are creating this kind of binary organization that you'll be familiar with from my drawing videos. We're talking here about shadow and light and how that is going to have an implication 
on the color values that you choose to put into those areas. I suggest here that you give yourself maybe three or four values to actually fill up the canvas. What that means then is that each area that we're filling up is going to be compressed and simplified. So where I might be able to look into the shadow below the jaw and below the chin and see several different values, or I might be able to look at the forehead of the model and also see several different color values there, I'm biding my time, I'm holding off from applying several different color values I'm trying to keep it super simple until such time that I've created a very useful and practical context to expand out from. In this moment, I'm just using maybe a couple of small brushes and very little medium. I'm just trying to thinly apply the paint to the canvas. The reason I mentioned that it should be rather thin is just because you don't wanna wind up in a place where you're actually kind of fighting against the colors that you blocked in. This block-in process really is going to represent maybe 15 to 20 minutes out of a two-hour process that will be the first pass in color on this painting. This moment of the painting is what it looks like when you have made your initial block in of super simplified color values. If we look at the head right now, I have maybe five or six values that I'm representing and maybe two to three different colors or color groups within those values. And since we're ready to start expanding on this idea of color values that are going to become more diverse, I wanna bring up a really brilliant painting that shows really specifically the idea that I like to carry into this moment. This portrait by John Singer Sargent is a prime example of a painter who is maintaining a unity in value while creating a diversity in color. This concept is something that really we want to expand on in every area that we're working. One of the biggest mistakes that we can make starting to integrate color diversity into a painting is to start to interrupt the unity of the value planes that we've created in our initial block-in. That doesn't mean, of course, that we will have no value change. It simply means that we want to maintain, for the most part, a sense of unity in relationship to the light source. So, looking at the forehead, for instance, while at the moment there is just a small amount of form, I will create slightly more value diversity in order to create a stronger sense of form. But while I am adding warmer and cooler temperatures to that plane, I'm going to maintain value steps that are not more than two phases away on a value scale. So now that we're coming towards the end of the painting, I want to just take a moment actually and go back to the very beginning of this process when we had just a raw umber outline. Our first job was to fill the canvas. We just wanted to kind of create a context in which we could then kind of elaborate on the colors and values that we were going to be using while we were kind of mapping out our color value tiles throughout the entire composition. We were working really thinly at first, but we wanted each stage to be totally complete. And it's only by embracing that sense of expressing a complete thought and a complete stage that we're able to make a kind of harmonious impression in which every part supports every other part in the painting. The forehead, for instance, couldn't appear so bright if the side plane of the cheek and the ear and the side of the neck were not, in fact, as dark as they are. So this is an evidence of a fully functioning context of color and value. Let's return then to where the painting is exactly at this moment. We have rich dark halftones and thick buttery highlights. The painting is really starting to come into itself and come alive from a kind of technical perspective. By that I mean, of course, that there are really two layers of what we're doing, at least. 
we are trying to develop a very interesting impression that from a distance reads very well. But also because we are lovers of oil paint, we're also trying to embrace the sense of what the most interesting and dynamic aspects of this material are. One of the ways in which you can show a very high dynamic range in this material is to embrace that sense of thickness versus thinness. Thick, fully opaque brush strokes will tend to reflect light out without letting those rays bounce through to the layers beneath. A thin wash of oil paint will allow light rays to go in and bounce off the ground underneath them and back into our eyes, thus creating a kind of resonant and warm deep shadow. These two aspects, of course, have to work in concert with each other, and that's where that sense of harmony and balance comes in. If we prioritize too much the thick, expressive nature of paint, we may, in a sense, compromise our ability to control the clarity of the impression we're making, and vice versa as well. Focusing too much only on the big picture and the more journalistic aspects of paint application, we might find ourselves with a painting that though adequate, does not look exciting. We've also reached the stage at this moment where we have a lot of variety in the kind of edges at the meetings of these values. If we look at the softness and turning form at the bottom right hand edge of the jawline and contrast that against the ending of the form of the forehead on the left, these two vastly different edges are necessary to help create that clear and concrete sense of form that we're chasing. The other thing that is a paramount concern at this moment is that we achieve a greater degree of subtlety. One way that we can break down the idea of subtlety and figure out what we actually mean when we say that is to consider what something that is obtuse or too simplified is. Value contrasts that meet with hard edges and lack a sense of interrelationship in between them are what I would call oversimplified and thus not very subtle. Subtle color value relationships will reflect both the unity of the plane that they are on and the color diversity necessary to become really fleshy and beautiful. So that's what I'm after here. Eventually, when we move on to the next stage of this painting, we're going to be searching for refinement and modeling, but we'll get to that in the next lesson. For now, I just want to provide you with your assignment for this moment. Now that you've seen me take my painting to this stage, what I want you to do in your studio at home is to take a look at each individual plane of the head. Compare the values in the darker planes of the head to those that we find in the lightest planes of the head. For instance, if I look down at the light shape of the neck on the right hand side, I want to compare those darker values there to the lighter values that we find in the forehead. If I find too much competition in between those values or too much similarity, meaning that the right hand side of the neck would be consumed in very light values, I'm going to wind up diminishing the sense of luminosity that I should be achieving on those very light planes. Remember that each and every one of the color values that you choose has to work in concert for the impression to resemble reality. This more than anything, I think, is one of the hardest things for an artist to learn to apply to their work. It requires that we are juggling many different balls at the same time. While we are looking at the design of shapes and the proportions of the head, we're also looking at the thickness and thinness of paint. We're looking to make sure that the gradations that we're creating from light to dark have a sense of uniformity and flow to them, meaning that we are not breaking up the transition with light values in a dark section of the form and dark values in a light section of the form. We are making rational and very visual and form filled transitions. At the same time, we don't want to model the roundness of our head as if it was a cylinder or a sphere. We want there to be shapes within those planes. This is the way that we secure a sense of structure in our painting. And remember, the enemy of structure in painting is really an over-reliance on brushwork. Try as much as you can not to smooth away all of your brush strokes, because really this is an indication of a painting that eventually will become too soft and generic. I'm sure that hearing it described that way, you could understand why we don't want to embrace that in our paintings. 